incredible letter for battle-weary Christians who are living in a battle-weary world. There is strength to be found and you will find it in the Lord. There is victory to be had and you will have it in Christ. Paul's advice in what really is the pinnacle of this letter of Ephesians is that we must continue to look to God and we must continue to be battle-ready. Strong in faith, strong in hope, strong in love. We must stay battle ready as Christians because even though our victory is assured, because we know the victory is there, Easter, the death and resurrection of Jesus accomplished it, nevertheless, Satan, our enemy, has not yet been disarmed. Verse 10 tells us, finally, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. Soldier, are you battle ready? There's a game called skirmish. Sometimes it's called paintball. I think maybe painball would be a better name for it because if you're caught at close range, those pellets can leave you with some very big bruises. In skirmish, the most important rule is no one takes off their helmet while they're still on the battlefield. No one takes off their helmet when they're still on the battlefield. Who wants to play paintball? (laughs) One stray paint pellet can take your eye out. Hey, you, get that helmet back on now. In a moment of stupidity, at the end of a game, my friend took off his helmet to wipe away the sweat from his face and he was very severely rebuked, and rightly so. Because even though the game was over, No one takes off their helmet when they're still on the battlefield. And that goes for us as Christians as well because Satan, our enemy, hasn't yet been disarmed. And he doesn't care about the rules. He doesn't play fair. So the question is, are you battle ready as Christ has called you to be? We need to be battle ready as Christians. I'm not saying that we should be paranoid, but I am saying we must be prepared because your soul and my soul is still in Satan's firing line. I once had a gun pointed at me, a real gun. I was about 16 years old. We were out on a farm. We were riding a motorbike around. We were having fun, taking turns riding the motorbike. Meanwhile, one of the boys my age emerged from the farm shed with a rifle. And he started to aim it at me as I was kind of riding the motorbike around. Boy, was I angry with him. What if it had been a bullet in there? What if something had happened and he'd pulled the trigger? Today's passage reminds us that spiritually speaking, Satan has got us in his sights. We don't like to think about that, do we? Perhaps we think it's not really as true as the Bible suggests it is. But our passage today is very clear. Satan will shoot you if he can. He'll hit you with all the temptations known to mankind. Paul calls them here the flaming arrows of the evil one. In verse 16, do you see that? The flaming arrows of the evil one. And do you think you don't need to be careful when you're still on the battlefield? You better be careful. The battle is all around us. It's in your marriage, it's in your school, it's in your workplace and it's in your home. It's everywhere because, guess what, the battlefield is you. It doesn't stop when you come through the doors of the church. The battlefield is you. You're the battlefield. Your soul is the prize. Now Jesus has won the victory for you. And yet the skirmish still goes on until Christ returns. 
The skirmish still goes on until Christ returns. Now is not the time to be complacent. You must be vigilant. You must be strong. You must be battle ready. That's why I want to start this morning with an overview of the person and work of Satan. This is my first point for today. Know your enemy. Any soldier will tell you how important it is to know your enemy. So who is Satan? Well, the Bible tells us that Satan is the one who stands behind all the disobedience and sin in our world today. However, Satan is not actually a name. It's a title. Did you know that? It's not a name. It's a title and it means the accuser. He is the accuser of God's people. He is the great adversary of the church. And surprising as it may sound, Satan was not always evil. Satan is a fallen angel who was once good. When God created the world, the Bible tells us, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. And that includes Satan. But by the time we get to Genesis chapter 3, and the Bible doesn't explain any of this, how it happened, what changed, really, it's a bit of a mystery, but by the time we get to chapter 3, it's clear that a major rebellion has taken place. As Satan is there in God's garden, disguised as the serpent, but he's looking for a way to ruin mankind. And he does. He plants a seed of doubt in Eve's heart, and together with Adam, she crosses the line into sin. They disobey God's command. They question his goodness. They believe the lie. And that was the start of all our problems today. It was Satan who led Adam and Eve into original sin. It was Satan who accused Job, that righteous man of serving God for profit and who then afflicted him with physical and mental agony. It was Satan who incited David to sin with Bathsheba and for Isaiah and Ezekiel it was Satan who controlled the brutal tyrant kings of Tyre and Babylon. Come to the New Testament and you'll find Satan appearing in all kinds of places. It was Satan who tempted Jesus to bow down and worship him. It was Satan who inflicted a crippled woman with her illness for 18 years. It was Satan who tempted Peter to rebuke Jesus for talking about the cross. Satan who enticed Judas to become the betrayer and Satan who tormented the Apostle Paul with a thorn in his flesh, whatever it was. And Paul prayed to Jesus about that and Jesus said to him, No, my grace is sufficient for you for my power is made perfect in weakness. So you see, Satan is very powerful but there's no need for Christians to panic. Because the Bible also assures us that Satan is going down. Jesus has had the victory. But in Revelation chapter 12 verse 9, we read where it says the great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled down to the earth and his angels with them. So there's been a heavenly battle and Satan has been defeated and now his time is limited. Jesus has had the victory, Satan is going down. Yet in the meantime, we still have to wait, wait for Jesus to return, to come back and to, and to deal with all the, the mopping up operations that need to be had. In the meantime, we must stay battle ready. So to help us, God has given us his super suit to wear. I love the Incredibles, that uh, movie. Where's my super suit? I love that line. Oh, here Paul calls it the full armour of God. Put on the full armour of God by exercising faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be battle ready to meet whatever Satan throws at you. I want you to look at verse 13. Look at what Paul says there. Verse 13. Therefore, what must we do? Put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything to stand. Our struggle, our skirmish is not against flesh and blood 
but against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And that's where the real danger lies. So that's Satan. That's his schemes, his poise. That's the challenge we face as Christians today. But it does rather raise the question, doesn't it? Where is God in all of this? Where is our sovereign Lord? My answer is, well, he is sovereign and he will do what's right. It's actually complicated. Philosophically, we say God's will is complex. His will as our creator is to sustain the universe. His will as our judge is to expose and condemn sin. His will as our saviour is to rescue and redeem us even from his own judgement. God's will is complex. It has many facets to it. And actually we have to trust him in that because he's God. We trust his character. We trust his purposes. Even when we can't quite understand how he's going to achieve all these things for our good. So on the one hand, I think we can all say we're happy to know that God's will is to rescue and to save us through faith in Jesus. We we love that part, we understand that, but we are rather perplexed to hear, I think, that God's will is to save us without denying Satan his power to destroy us. God's will is to save us without denying Satan his power to destroy us. That's a little bit more uncomfortable. Why would God do that? Why doesn't he just get rid of Satan now? I don't think we can answer that completely, but it seems to me I can say a couple of things that that help that are helpful. First of all, because our first parents rebelled against God, we actually do have a relationship with Satan such that we are born into slavery to sin because of what Adam and Eve did. We are, we are actually born into slavery. So it, it, there's, there's, a, there's a power, a, a right that Satan can exercise, an illegitimately gained one, but nevertheless we have been born into this slavery. So that's one reason. We actually do have a relationship with Satan. Another reason is that God treats no one like a puppet. I mean, his sovereignty exercised in such a way that we must make our own choices. We have real responsibility. God treats no one like a puppet. And it's in the very nature of love that we must be free to choose. I mean, love cannot be compelled, can it? Love cannot be compelled. Without freedom, love becomes mere obedience like obeying the policeman when you can see him with the radar detector in his hand. That's not love, that's just mere obedience. So we're born as slaves to sin and God has to rescue us even from his own judgement and he has to do it without treating us as puppets and he has to do it whilst allowing us to make choices. And he does this sovereignly and this is to God's glory because if you can figure all that out, you're doing better than I am. But I kind of sense that it's right and that it works and it it accords to my spirit of understanding of what the Bible teaches us about how we must live in the world until Christ returns. There is a tension in all of this. But I'm encouraged by the words earlier in Ephesians It is by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God so that no one may boast. So we trust in God's sovereignty and we make right choices in the world until Christ returns. Meanwhile, it is God's will that we should freely choose to put on the full armour of God which he has so lovingly given us in Jesus Christ. And so this is my second point for this morning, our God-given armour. We're going to follow similar ground to what was in the kids' talk. So in your bulletins, you'll find six lines ready to be filled in under point number two. And if you've got a pen, I'd encourage you to fill those answers in now. What are the six parts that make up the full armour of God starting in verse 14? Well, the first one is the belt of truth. That's right. And also in verse 14, the breastplate of righteousness. Excellent. 
So truth and righteousness on your feet is the readiness of the gospel of peace. That's in verse 15. You come down to verse 16, you've got the shield of faith, excellent. And then in verse 17, the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. So that's great. That's what we're looking at. In 1655, there was a Puritan minister called William Gurnall and he published a major work called The Christian in Complete Armour. And his focus was just these few verses of scripture from verse 10 down to verse 20 and yet he managed to write three volumes with 261 chapters on the subject of the Christian and the armour of God. You've got to love the Puritans. They can get a lot of information and apply it. Reflecting on these verses, in one place he writes this, he says, In heaven we shall appear not in armour but in robes of glory, but here on earth the pieces of the armour are to be worn night and day. We must walk, work and sleep in them or else we're not true soldiers of Christ. In this armour we are to stand and watch and never relax our vigilance for the saint's sleeping time is Satan's tempting time. And I think he means there that when we take down our guard, when we become relaxed, as it were, when we take our eye off the ball, we're very quickly able to be tempted and to fall. It also reminds me of Nehemiah when they were building the wall and there was few of them and many enemies and they were battle ready. They held one in one hand the sword and the other hand they did the work. And I think that's an image too for us to take on, that we must be constantly battle ready as we do the work of the gospel in our world today. We must be battle ready. We must be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. We must actually put on the armour It's been given to us, but we must put it on. That means discipline in life. That means making time to read your Bible and to pray and to do ministry and to grow in righteousness, in the knowledge of the truth, in being peaceable with others, in in, in exercising your faith, trusting in Jesus. You've got to put it on. It's one thing to have the armour of God sitting in the corner. It's got to be on. Our goal is to survive and to hold our ground and to stand against evil and when necessary to fight for the truth and even to die for it. For if we die, we live. In that moment when we think we're safe, then Satan is easily able to do his worst. It's been pointed out that in all the description of the God-given armour, the full armour of God, there's actually no back piece. The Romans definitely had a back piece in their armour, but it's not mentioned here. And it's, uh, it's, it's said, we, you need to always face the enemy. You know, if you turn around, turn it back to Satan, run, uh, he's got an easy target. I think that speaks of courage and facing the enemy, no matter what the cost. So we need to put the armour on, we need to wear it, we need to wear it courageously. You must know the truth to defend yourself from all kinds of falsehood. So then, first of all, let's put on the belt of truth. Now, that belt was an essential part of the centurion's military gear. You can see it there. It was a belt attached to a kind of protective leather apron. It would have been the first piece of armour that was put on. That's why I think it's mentioned first. It's also the last defence against an enemy's attack on your thighs because there's just a little bit of extra leather armour there between your flesh and the armour around your legs. Very important to know the truth and to wear it. So put the truth on each morning. Put it on by reading your Bible, having a quiet time in the morning, day by day, meditating on God's word. Don't run out the door without putting your armour on. Know the truth. Study the word, meditate on it, go deep. Make the time to understand each part and component of the truth and how it fits together. Buckle it on nice and tight so that when you go out to your office and you face all those ungodly people who are living and doing all kinds of things and you're serving them as a Christian, you you know, all the different challenges that we face. Well, you've got the truth. 
buckled on. It's the truth that keeps all things in their proper place. It's the truth that stops our faith and hope from shifting. It's the truth that holds God's word at the ready, even the sword of the spirit which is going to be attached to that belt. So anyone who loses the truth or forgets it or breaks it or treats it with contempt will not stand on the battlefield. It needs to be buckled on nice and tight. Love the truth and defend the truth and so you'll be strengthened in your faith and grow in your confidence as a Christian. This is what it means to wear the belt of truth today. Second, the breastplate of righteousness. Well, holiness makes a huge difference. From a military point of view, the breastplate protects your most vital organs. What have you got behind the breastplate? A heart, a lungs. You get through there, you're dead, aren't you? Well, that's how righteousness works for you as a Christian. It is your breastplate and it protects your, most, your innermost being from the enemy. When you're righteous, there can be no charges that laid against you that will stick. Certainly in God's eyes. Today as Christians, we must trust in the righteousness of Christ to turn that blade away and keep us safe and secure. The, the blade that Satan, the, the fiery darts that he would fire, you're protected with that breastplate of righteousness so that whatever Satan throws at you, you will survive. What does it look like to wear the breastplate of righteousness today? Well, you must be ready to respond to evil without sinning yourself. Don't think that two wrongs make a right. Don't think of payback. Don't do evil, thinking that good may come of it. At all times, try to act with integrity toward others. Stand firm in the truth and do what's right in God's sight. If you do that, you can put your head on the pillow at night and sleep soundly. And you will allow Satan no opportunity to get through to your heart. Next in verse 15 comes the soldier's footwear, which is likened to the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. What did Roman soldiers wear on their feet? I've got a picture for you there again. They wore special sandals that gave them an advantage over their enemies. Just like the gospel of peace gives us an agility and a freedom to move this way and that, meet each person at their point of need, so the soldier could depend on his sandals to gain, to gain the best footing in whatever position he was in. They were light and flexible, and they kept the toes free, which meant the less blisters when you were marching, apparently so. And underneath, the sandals were studded with nails, just like football boots today. And this gave the Roman soldier a great advantage when the ground was slippery and wet, when the arguments sliding this way and that. His feet could stand secure because he had those studs and they would cut through and help him to stand on solid ground. In the same way, the gospel of peace enables us to stand our ground as Christians. We're not going to slip and slide all around the place when our feet are shod with the readiness of the gospel of peace. A sure footing, a sure knowledge of that gospel and the willingness to be a peacemaker for Jesus will give you great confidence as you speak to people about your faith. You see, if I know the peace of Christ in my own heart, then I don't actually need to worry what other people think of me. I'm freed from that judgment that others may set upon me because I have the peace of Christ in my heart. I know that I'm loved by God and set free from those kinds of self-judging or other judging values. I can be flexible, I can be honest, I can be patient I can tell people the truth and allow them to respond to me as they will. Uh, this is the freedom that comes with the readiness of the gospel of peace. So we've looked at truth, we've looked at righteousness, we've looked at the gospel of peace. Let's look at the next item in verse 16, the shield of faith. 
Well, there were two types of shields that Roman soldiers used. The big rectangular one that covered the whole body and a smaller rounder one that was used in hand-to-hand combat. So I'm going to ask you to guess, which shield do you think is the shield of faith that Paul had in mind? The big one, big rectangular one or the round one? Who goes for the big rectangular one? Okay, who goes for the round one? Okay, so in other words, we don't know. (laughs) But actually we do know because the word that's used is the big rectangular one. The big rectangular one is the one that Paul has in mind. It protected the whole body. You could get in behind it. It was also used in their turtle formation. You had the whole army there and they would bang them up together. There's safety in numbers. So Paul calls this the shield of faith. He says, in addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. You see, this large shield was made of two layers of wood covered in linen and animal skin and rimmed with iron. And before battle, they would soak the shield in water because it had the linen and the animal skin on it. And this would protect the soldiers against the flaming arrows that they would be fired by the enemies because the arrows would come in, there's two layers of wood, they'd bury into the softer layer of wood and they would be extinguished by the water in the linen and the animal skin. So that's a pretty clever design, isn't it, to have on that shield. So too, our faith in Jesus must be flexible and yet firm, able to withstand all kinds of attacks without breaking. Uh, Satan's going to fire at us. Our faith is going to get the arrows in it, but we're not going to die as we exercise our faith. Faith is, is your great shield. Use it wisely. Use it well. And yes, there is safety in numbers. Be faithful in getting to church and growing together as a body of Christ. You are the army. Christ is the general and he's given you his armour to wear. Well, there's still two more items to go, isn't there? Two more. In verse 17, Paul completes the picture with the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Every soldier needs a helmet to protect his head and a sword with which to fight. I'm just going to read to you something fantastic that John Bunyan writes. I just love this passage. You kind of get the idea of the helmet of righteousness and the sword of the Spirit. Let me just paint the picture as as John Bunyan does. He says this, Then Apollyon the devil, seeing his opportunity, began to gather up close to Christian and wrestling with him, gave him a dreadful fall. And with that, Christian's sword flew out of his hand. Then Apollyon said, I am sure of thee now. And with that, he had almost pressed him to death so that Christian began to despair of life. But as God would have it, while Apollyon was fetching of his last blow, thereby to make a full end of that good man, Christian nimbly reached out his hand for his sword and caught it, saying, Rejoice not against me, O mine enemy. When I fall, I shall arise. And with that, Christian gave him a deadly thrust, which made him give back as one that had received a mortal wound. Christian, perceiving his advantage, made at him again, saying, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And with that, Apollyon spread forth his dragon's wings and sped away so that Christians saw him no more. Wow, what a great image that is of a Christian fighting the battle. Soldier, are you battle ready? Is your truth belt buckled on? Is righteousness your heart's defence? Are your feet shod with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace? Is faith your body shield? Is the saving power of Jesus your helmet? Are you ready, like Christian, to slay Satan with the faithful sword of scripture? I trust that you are. But if not, I urge you today to get battle ready as you need to be. You know, as well as I do, we live in a time of great uncertainty 
Now, culture is in a mess. Everything from climate change to cultural confusion and gender identity, people are scared about the world and where it's heading. But here today, God's word reminds us and encourages us to know that Jesus has had the victory and that Satan is going down. And we are simply called on to be battle ready. Well, that brings me to our final point for today. We must not neglect prayer, our necessary supply for strength and help and courage in the battle. We must pray. A wise man once said, the Christian fights upon his knees. I like that. A Christian fights upon his knees. How true. See, as we look at the passage, verse 18, which seems to start a new sentence, doesn't really. Verse 18 is actually joined to the command to stand firm in verse 14. It goes all the way back up to verse 14 and comes down to verse 18. So what Paul is saying here, it actually makes prayer the final and most important ingredient to activate the armour. Prayer is our necessary supply without which we don't survive. So what he's saying is, Put on the full armour of God, the belt, the breastplate, the shoes, the shield, the helmet, the sword, yeah, got all of that, and pray. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. You see, that makes a difference, doesn't it? Put on the whole armour of God and pray. Prayer is so important, you can't do without it. I wonder if you can really buckle that truth belt tightly apart from prayer. I wonder if you can even put the helmet of salvation on without prayer. Prayer activates and emboldens us in our confidence and sharing of the word of God and in our ministry of the work of the gospel. You know, in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, Frodo's sword, what's it called? What's Frodo's sword called? Sting. I love that name. What a great name for a sword. Well, it glows when danger is near. Frodo's sword, sting, glows when danger is near. So too with God's word, when it's activated by prayer. Never underestimate the power of prayer. Not because we're powerful in ourselves, but because God empowers his servants through prayer. The Christian fights upon his knees. Do you think Paul was joking when he said verse 18 and 19? He said, with this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. And he says, pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it fearlessly as I should. Pray, 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 keep on praying and pray again. Well, let's pray that God will increase our zeal for his truth this day. That will increase our hope in the gospel, our courage for righteousness, our love for one another and our joy in Christ. And let us pray that he will make us battle ready as people in this generation who need to be battle ready, that we might be strong in the Lord and able to speak fearlessly about the hope we have in Jesus. One thing that concerns me deeply at the moment is that too many of our church leaders in the evangelical world have no fight in them, it seems to me. What happened to the fighting spirit of Ephesians? The gospel must be connected with our lives and connected with our communities, with all these big issues we face in our world today, like gender diversity, sexual depravity, the abuse of children, changes to the abortion laws, all these challenges that we face, we must be able to connect our faith with the people whose lives are affected, including our own. It's time for us to fight on our knees. So now we come to the end of the letter. And to Paul's final words in verses 23 and 24. Short and sweet. Peace to the brothers and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. 
Peace, love, faith and grace. These are the great themes of the gospel and they are the signature of Paul's apostolic ministry. Paul's letter to the Ephesians is a letter for battle-weary Christians living in a battle-weary world and brothers and sisters, isn't that us? It's so relevant for us today. Our world is in a terrible mess and things seem to be getting worse. As Christians we've been complacent and I think we've even been complicit with those whose aim is to destroy the church. And so we really need God to revive us again and by his spirit to renew our hope in Christ. What does it look like for us to wear this full armour of God today? Well, I'm just going to give you four take-home thoughts to, to reflect upon. What does it look like to wear it today? I think first of all it means choosing what's right, not what's easy. We need to do the right thing even to our own cost. Not take shortcuts where justice or integrity is concerned. Choosing what's right, not what's easy. I think it means withstanding temptation in our own lives wherever that temptation comes. We've got to face Satan. Face him down. That's hard. It's our personal battle. Each one of us. I think it means not surrendering my faith in public, which I find so much pressure to do, just to stay silent when I should speak. Now, the Christian life is not about being set free from suffering in this life, but rather standing firm in our faith despite the suffering. So we must battle on. Choosing what's right, withstanding temptation, not surrendering our faith, and certainly it means prayerfulness. Bringing it all together, binding it together in prayer is something that we can do better at. I know I can and I pray that our whole church will. I've been talking to Beverly, and we've already set some dates for prayer meetings that are going to happen through the year but we don't have to just use those dates. Uh, we can pray in our link groups and we can gather, we can have prayer networks, we can pray for one another. If your heart is a, prayer, a prayer heart for prayer, then brother or sister, we need you. We need you to exercise those gifts in our congregation that we might pray for one another. And now here is the encouragement we need. There is strength to be found and you'll find it in the Lord. There is victory to be had and you'll have it in Christ. So look to the rising of the sun and stay battle ready. Strong in faith, strong in hope, strong in love. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. And remember this, the Christian fights upon his knees. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this wonderful, challenging, timely passage from Ephesians. For each one of us, there is work to be done. We know we're all works in progress. But we want to have our feet set upon Christ the solid rock. We want to have that belt of truth anchored around our waists. We want to wear the helmet of salvation. We want to put on the full armour of God and we want to pray that you would use us in our generation to fight the good fight until Christ returns. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.